Hi everybody, this is Andy from Andy's Travel Blog here with a couple of tips for moonscape photography. Now the reason I'm putting this video out now is there's something very astronomically significant occurring 31st January 2018, which is just a couple of days from now. Now these tips will apply for other moonscape settings or uh, just general tips for taking pictures of the moon, but it's really important right now because you're probably seeing it all over the news. So anyways, uh, what's taking place 31st January 2018 is you have three phenomenon or phenomena occurring at the same time. So first off, you have a supermoon, and all the supermoon is is simply, so you have like Earth right here, and then you have the moon orbiting around the Earth. But it's not a perfect circle around the Earth, it's kind of an elliptical shape, it's not to the scale by any means. Um, and there are certain times when the moon is closer to Earth versus further away, and the supermoon is when it passes its closest point to the Earth. It doesn't make that big of a difference, it's not like this is the moon versus this is the moon normally. Uh, it's it, but it, it makes about a 10 to 15 percent difference, and in my opinion, you can really see the, the size difference in the moon when it's close to the horizon. So that's what a supermoon is. Then you have a blood moon, and that's when it's a lunar eclipse, where the, the moon, and this is actually kind of cool, the moon is uniquely like the size in our sky, the same size in our sky that the sun is, just due to the distance it happens to be that, and it's very unique to our moon. None of the other moons, uh, none of Saturn's moons or Jupiter's moons or anything like that, or anything close to that. So that's kind of cool, but the moon perfectly covers the sun, and then what you have is the sunlight gets uh, refracted around or diffracted around uh, the moon, and the red wavelength is visible. So you end up with a reddish looking moon. So that's why they call it a blood moon. The third thing, it's not really as much of an astronomical phenomenon as it is a calendorial phenomenon. Uh, that's the blue moon. So the blue moon is quite simply when you have two full moons in the same month. And so this is January. I think we had a full moon on the 2nd of January, and we have another one on the 31st of January. And it, that happens, I think, every two years and nine months, something like that. And that's where the phrase once in a blue moon comes from. So we have a super blood blue moon, blue super blood moon, uh, blue blood super moon if you're a fan of the Tom Selleck show. Uh, but anyways, I want to talk, I want to give you a couple of tips. Uh, but before I get to the tips, let's talk about gear. Okay, now I'll tell you what I'm gonna use, but I, I wanna equate this to what you might be using as well. Now, no matter what camera, no matter what lenses you wanna use, I really recommend a tripod, your trusty little tripod. Uh, this is my trusty Mi Photo Globe Trotter. I've taken with, with me literally all over the world, beating the crap out of the poor thing, but it's still with me. So Mi Photo, uh, they're not paying me to say this, I wish they would, to be honest, but um, it, have a tripod that works for you. It doesn't need to be a Mi Photo, it doesn't need to be a really right stuff or anything super expensive, but just make sure that it's stable and it'll hold the weight of your camera. Now, speaking of camera, you have a couple of different options. So um, I have a Sony a7R II in my hand right here, and this is a full frame camera. Now, what a lot of people will wanna do if they wanna get really tight uh, on the moon is they'll use a crop body camera. So like a Sony a6500, uh, a Nikon uh, D5500, a Canon 80D or a 7D Mark II. I'll probably be using a full frame, and you have two different lens choices. So this, sorry, I'm using a new little monitor so I can see where my hands are. This is a 12 to 24 millimeter, super ultra mega wide lens, and I'll be putting that on my a7R II, potentially. And this would be the shot if you wanna get, like you wanna capture the super moon in context, rather than just get a picture of the moon. If you want to, get just a picture of the moon, then you would need something like this, a telephoto lens. Now this is a 70 to 200. You'd probably need something a little bit longer than this. You'd want like a 300 to 400, 500, 600 millimeter telephoto lens. Honestly, if you're using a 600 millimeter telephoto lens, you probably already know what you need to do. I don't know if I can be of any help in this video, but feel free to keep watching. So let's talk about the options. So with a telephoto lens, if you want to get a picture of just the moon and you want to have it for your collection, that's great. I would say let's try to think of something more creative. So instead of just getting a picture of the moon, let's think about what we can do with like a wider angle lens to get the moon and place it in some sort of context. So tip number one is going to be place in context, okay? The subject of your picture is going to be the super blood blue moon. Um, but let's talk about like where to put it in a landscape. Where wh What's going to surround it? How are you going to frame the actual moon? So, so as an example, I want to use this picture right here. And let me zoom in real quick uh, so you can see the picture. 
This picture is one that I took. Look at me all recommending my own pictures. I took this picture uh, when there was a lunar eclipse going on um, over Dallas. And instead of just taking a picture of the phases of the moon, I wanted to set it in, I, I wanted to show its movement through the sky, and I wanted it to be seen in its natural context. So um, that's why I took a backplate image of this bridge in Dallas, the Margaret Hill Hunt Bridge, um, and the skyline of Dallas in the background, so I could see the moon as it kind of went through the sky. I think that was a little bit more creative, and honestly, the reason I say try to find something to place the moon in some sort of context is that odds are there's going to be a lot of astronomers and a lot of people with better cameras than you are, or than you have and than I have, pointing their cameras right at the moon and taking a picture only of the moon. Now, some people would try to uh, look at the moon and get a picture of like the, an airplane flying across or like the International Space Station flying across the moon. If you wanna do that, again, you're probably already set up for that. I don't know how much I can help you there. So tip one, let's find some context. Now, in order to do this, you may have to composite some images together in Photoshop. So if you have your, um, for example, going back to that eclipse picture, I took that picture of uh, of Dallas about 10 minutes before the moon started going up into the sky. Uh, and the reason I did that is the moon is, you end up needing a different shutter speed for the moon than you do for the rest of the scene. And that's actually gonna be point two, shutter speed. Pay very close attention to your shutter speed. Odds are the scene that you have before you is going to require a different shutter speed to properly expose the scene than the moon is. The moon ends up being quite bright. Now it may be different because we're talking about an eclipse situation here, but you just need to be careful with shutter speed. It's quite bright and it also moves through the sky surprisingly quickly. I mean, there have been cases where I've been shooting like F8, 1 800th of a second at ISO 100, and I could still see a little movement in it. So you're gonna need to be in manual mode, you're gonna need to play around with it, and you're, gonna, you're going to need to adjust your shutter speed as the moon moves across the sky. So just be, pay very close attention to that, and be ready to have like this image over here, and then take your moon shots, and then combine them together in Photoshop. And if you need any help doing that, leave some comments below. I may do a tutorial for you to show you a real quick and easy way of doing that, okay? so. Uh, let's pay attention to the context, let's pay attention to our shutter speed, and then the third thing, as always, do your research, okay? Uh, and there's a couple of tools that I wanna give you to do that. So there's a website called timeanddate.com or .org or something like that, I'll put a link to that below. That is going to tell you exactly when the eclipse is gonna happen for your local area. I'm in Dallas, Texas, we're actually not getting a ton of the eclipse. Uh, for us, the eclipse starts at 4.51 a.m. on 31st January. Uh, and the maximum, like the maximum eclipse stage, by the time we get to that, I think it's 7.26 a.m., the sun's are, or the moon's already gonna be below the horizon for us. So we really get, like, we have a cool opportunity to take part of the eclipse or take pictures of part of the eclipse, but that's kind of it. It may be different for your region, but go to this website and it'll tell you exactly what to expect. So you, you have your, you're not gonna get your hopes up and then end up with a really cool image of nothing because the sun or the moon's below the horizon already. And then another tool that I wanna tell you about is the photographer's, I don't know how to pronounce this next word, ephemeris, ephemeris, epahimer, I have no idea. Um, I call it TPE because I refuse to look up how to pronounce that word. So uh, TPE is a uh, photography planning app that basically has an overlay of Google Maps and allows you to set your location anywhere in that Google Map and it's gonna show you the relative position of the sunrise and the sunset and the moonrise and the moonset. And this is great for planning stuff because let's say you're in, I don't know, Cincinnati, and you wanna see where the moon's gonna be rising, uh, you can basically say, all right, let's, I wanna feature the Great American Ballpark in my shot. And I have no idea why I picked either of those, I've never been to either of those uh, places, but um, what you would do is you would go find that on your Google Maps and you would basically put your location in there and you would see the, the angle of the sun. So you'd basically be able to see is the sunrise gonna be over the Great American Ballpark or is it gonna be next to it? And that allows you to, to plan your locations a little bit better. Uh, and w one thing I will say about research, as you get all your research together, um, a lot of people are gonna use skylines to frame the moon uh, and skyscrapers. Just pay attention to where your skyscrapers are in your frame, okay? Because if you have like a big skyscraper right here and the moon's gonna rise up behind it, well then you're not gonna see the moon until it's above it. And that's great and all, but just you wanna make sure that, let's say your skyscraper's gonna be right here and then the moon's gonna come up right here, 
that's awesome because the skyscraper is actually going to frame the moon for you and it's gonna make it's gonna use the negative space really well. So just make sure you know where your skyscrapers are, make sure you know where your horizon line is uh, when you're looking out through the lens, because you really want to be able to see a very clean horizon line in order to see the moon. So those are a three or I think three-ish or four tips and some compositional tips on moonscape photography, and that applies to any sort of moonscape, not just for the super blood blue moon, but it's pretty cool. January 31st, blood super moon blue something. Um, <laughs> I don't know. Uh, but anyways, um, I hope you've enjoyed these couple of tips. If you have any questions, leave them below and I'll answer them if I can. Best of luck shooting. Post some of your images. Po post links to your images below so we can all go check them out. Uh, and until next time, this is Andy from Andy's Travel Blog. Thank you so much for watching. We'll see you next time.